Well, good morning and welcome to Grace. We're glad to see everybody here this morning and we welcome those that are watching online. We, we are just th so thankful that we're able to still gather in some way, shape, or form um, as, as a body of Christ. Uh, I just want to start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into some announcements here this morning. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that you provide each day for us to wake up in the morning and face a new set of challenges, a new set of, of, of things that we do in life. And Lord, we ask that you would help us as we uh, go through those things and as we're presented with new, new challenges and new things that are coming up, Lord, with school and, and different such things. Lord, we ask that you would just help us to rely fully on you, to rely fully on your strength and not our own. Lord, we ask that you would bless today as we worship you and help us, help us to put you at the center of everything that we do today in our words and in our deeds. Lord, we ask that you would just bless today, help us to worship you well. In Jesus' name, amen. So some announcements just to keep you up to date and, and uh, kind of on cue with everything that we're doing here. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, online giving is available on our website and also through the PushPay app. Um, we also have uh, here in the building, if you're here with us, the offering plates are at each of the doors as you exit today. So if you want to just drop it in the plate, that would work too. And thank you so much for during this time uh, with your generosity towards our church and how we're able to still do many different things um, throughout this time. Uh, also be sure to check out in the Bible app, be sure to check out for um, our sermon notes and uh, kind of keep along with us in the, in the scriptures as we go through. Um, that's inside the Bible app. Uh, there will be no Grace Fit workout this week. Grace Fit will resume on Tuesday, September 8th. And if you remember, that's at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, just to be uh, ready for that on Tuesday, September 8th. There's also a time of prayer on, on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. If you'd like to join that, uh, email us at gracechurch at clintongrace.org, and we can include you on that list. If you have any requests for that, please make sure it also goes to that same email um, by noon that day on Tuesday. Uh, next Sunday, September 6th, we're going to be celebrating communion as part of our service here uh, in the building on September 6th. Now, that does not exclude those of you at home. Uh, it just means that we're going to have some supplies to be able to give to you. And as well as uh, when you're here on Sunday, you'll actually pick up your own uh, kind of disposable cup that has a wafer and cup together. Um, we'll ask you to do that on the way in. And then also, if you are at home and you're not going to be with us on Sunday and you'd still like to participate, we're going to have two pickup times. Uh, it'll be Thursday, September 3rd from 1 to 3. And we'll also have Friday, September 4th from 5 to 7. So if you'd like to swing by and pick up some communion supplies, let us know. Uh, we'll be set up and ready to go and, and be able to uh, give you all those supplies that you need. Um, real quick, uh, uh, be sure to be praying for schools this week. Um, as, as we start back, uh, especially here at Grace Brethren Christian School, um, we're praying that there's a very good, successful school year. We're praying that God would change lives through our school. It's, a, it's one of the biggest ministries we have. And um, so this week, we're going to be doing a prayer challenge. It'll be, there'll be prompts on, on our social media pages. Um, and each day will be kind of an assigned prayer request of sorts. Um, we'll pray for peace, not only for our staff, for, for our students, for our families. Um, and you'll be prompted on our Facebook page and Instagram page on how you can better uh, interact with that. But even if you don't participate in that prayer challenge, please be sure to lift up our schools as they begin this new uncharted land, uh, uncharted territory for most of them, um, and pray that we can be able to get through and that kids would be able to have their education and be able to be participants in the school here uh, with us. We're really excited about that. I know I have a teacher at home, so I'm praying for my, my wife, and I also have two students here, so we're, we're praying for both my kids as well. Uh, and their teachers. Um, real quick, uh, uh, too, is be sure that if you're watching online or if you're here with us and, and you got young kiddos, uh, anywhere from nursery all the way up through uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, sorry, uh, there is a Facebook page and even on our church website now, there is Sunday school material for your children. Uh, so if you go to clintongrace.org, you go to our Facebook page, uh, there should be a link there. 
um, but you'll have a video for, element for elementary, but you also have a uh, preschool video. So please be sure to watch those. We'll have a little bit of a snippet next week, hopefully, to show you a little bit of what that looks like um, if you haven't seen it before. All right, it's time to praise and worship with our worship team. Amen. Amen. Thank you for leading us in, in worship, that song. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a deep prayer, isn't it? To want to be tried by fire. Amazing. Amazing. Would you bow with me with prayer this morning? Father, we thank you so much that you have blessed us to be able to worship you. I pray, Lord God, as we open up your word, that you would speak to us. I pray you meet the needs of people. I pray for the Burr family right now as they mourn the loss of Barb's mother. Uh, may you work out all the details. Be with that family. Eston Porter, we pray for him and Pam, and we pray for the Porter family. And um, Father, we just say today, we need you. As I come and speak, I... I need you. I need your help. I need your grace. I need your strength. I need your leading. And as I, Lord God, as we look into your word, I pray that you would work in our lives and you would change us, that we would not be the same. That we would be not just hearers, but we would be doers of your beautiful word. Thank you for loving us, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching online, uh, we're so glad to have you here. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 16. That is my hope, okay? We'll see how far we get, uh, but uh, we're looking at this passage. As we're looking at this, rejoicing in Christ, one follower to another, as our theme this year is followership, we're learning what Paul has to say about what it means to follow him. And so we're, 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 learning, we're learning these things. Now, I, I've got to tell on myself a little bit. So uh, last week, I came out, and Tania and Kayla were, were practicing. And I said to myself, I'm going to go and let them know that I want to sing with them this morning. Yeah, and, and, and I said, and said, now, they don't have to turn my mic on. Just let me stand there and move my lips. Nobody needs to know the difference, right? So I, I didn't do it because I know I, I, I can imagine what their reaction was going to be. So, so last week, Pastor Hunt spoke, and um, when, he, when, he, when he preached, I did announcements. And so when I, got, when I finished doing the announcements, I walked off the stage, went back in the back, sat in my seat, and I forgot to turn my mic off. So apparently I was singing with the group, not realizing I was even singing. So apparently I'm, I'm hitting every other word, and, and Angela runs out. At some point, Angela runs out and says, turn Pastor Clark's mic off, because I was singing. And I, ta I talked with Jack, and Jack said, you know, I thought I heard a man's voice. And I was talking to my dad. I was like, I thought I heard a man's voice the whole time. So I, I told him myself, so the sound team knows that when I'm not using my mic, they have to turn my mic off, right? Because we don't want that to happen again. Yes, no, we don't, right. <laughs> Philippians uh, chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, I, I think we, 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 we get a picture of Paul's motivation in his life. This is what motivated Paul. This was Paul's goal. This was Paul's desire in life. And so we get a picture of the motivation of a mature follower. Now, God has called all of us to be followers. Understand that. We're all to be followers. Though we're saved by grace through faith, but following has a cost to it. Following pays a price. And so what we want to do is become mature followers. So if you look in, in verse 10, that's where Pastor Hunt left off last week, and he did a great job with those verses uh, before then. Paul says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection 
and may share in his suffering. Paul says, here is my motivation as a follower of Christ, that I might know Christ. John chapter 17, verse 3, says this, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is what eternal life is. Eternal life is not this, this golden street in heaven walking the pearly gates. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is having a relationship with God. And so Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, my goal, my motivation is that I want to know Christ. And that word know means to know experientially. It know, to know on a personal level, to know in relationship. It's not talking about knowing facts. So we have to ask the question, well, how do we know Christ? Well, can, can I go to the internet and, and, and do a Wikipedia to find out about Christ? Yeah, that, that would give you information about Christ. But that's not knowing him. You could talk to other people who know Christ and they can tell you all the things that Christ has done for them and what they're learning in Christ. But that's not you personally knowing Christ. Paul said, my motivation in life is I want to know Christ better. I want to know him experientially. I want to experience day to day living with him, that friendship that, that, that we have. I want to know him in that kind of way. You know what this is really is? How do we get to know Christ better? This is relationship 101. To break it down as to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the lowest denominator, we can break it down. To know Christ better, we have to spend time with him. There's no other way to do it. I can't know Christ better by reading things about him. I can't know Christ better by talking. To know Christ better, I have to spend time with him. If I were to ask you this, how, how, how much do you want to know Christ the next question is, how much time are you spending with him? Relationship 101. This is how we get to know each other. Relationship 101. When, when, when I do marriage counseling, one of the things I tell the husbands or the prospective husbands, I say this. One of the things that God says to you is you need to know your wife. You need to know your wife. And so you need to begin praying, Lord, help me to know my wife. And that's been my prayer. Lord, help me to know my wife. Help me to know my wife. And, 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 and God, and only how God can do that, God said to me, son, let's have a talk. You keep praying about knowing your wife and help me helping you know your wife, that's not going to happen. How are you going to know your wife is by spending time with your wife. And as you spend more time with your wife, I'll open your understanding to know your wife, but don't expect me to do some miracle in helping you know your wife when you're not spending time with your wife. Now, that's what God hit me upside the head with, just being honest. And so to know relationship, we have to understand. But he's, look, he says in verse 3, he says, he says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know Christ and I want to experience the power of the resurrection. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us this, that we shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That God has this power he wants us to have. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Ephesians 1, 18. Let me just get there and, and, and read that for us. Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 18. He, said, he says this. That your eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of your calling, what are the riches of your glory. I want you to know this. Verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to know and experience that great power, that same power that raised Christ from the dead. I want you to experience it. That's what Paul said. I want to know him in the power of the resurrection. In that same power that raised Christ from the dead, I want to experience that power in my life. It's pretty deep, isn't it? Now, how many of us would want to experience that resurrection power in our life to know him that well? Amen, right? But then Paul takes a turn that I wasn't expecting. Look, look what he says next. 
Back, back, in, back in the Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And may share in his suffering. Oh my gosh, Paul, what are you talking about? I was with you with the power. But Paul says, and my goal is to know him so well that I share in his suffering, that I am, am and, and, they, and they are conformed, that I'm in fellowship with his, what, is, is Paul some kind of mask? What, 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 what person wants to have suffering? Now, Lord, this is my prayer. If it comes, I'll deal with it, Lord, but I'm not asking for it. But Paul's saying I'm asking for it. Look at chapter 1, verse 29 of Philippians. 1, 29. Paul told us right at the beginning, for it has been granted to you, it has been favored, grace to you, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but should suffer for his sake. Wow. Paul is saying this, bring on the suffering. I so much appreciate the song you guys sang. Because it is the suffering that tries us and refines us and helps us to grow. We don't want it. But it's necessary in our life. John and John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus told them, because they persecuted me, understand they're going to persecute you. You're going to go through suffering, but it's not always what we want to do. So Paul says, this is what I want. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, and I want to know him in the fellowship or sharing in his suffering. Now, it takes maturity to get to the place where you're praying that, right? That takes maturity. But I want us to understand that those also really sort of go hand in hand. Because there's the power of the resurrection. There's some aspects of the power of the resurrection that you and I will not experience unless we're going through suffering. Does that make sense to you? See, sometimes you look at what people are going through and you say, I don't know if I could go through. I believe that God gives a certain type of sustaining grace to people when they're going through things. And there's certain types of that power we will never experience unless we're connected to that suffering. And that's when that grace and that power kicks in. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 I have nines to come up on the board, but I should have put nine and tens, but I want to read nine and ten for you too. He says, he says this in verse, in verse nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I would, I would boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. When I am weak, when suffering comes in and I am weak, that's when Christ's power comes upon me. For the sake of Christ... Then I am content with weakness, with insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says this. It is only when you are dealing with the suffering that Paul is requiring that certain power and strength kick in that you're really able under, to able understand and experience the power of the resurrection. In other words, they go hand in hand. If we're not praying for the, power, the, the, the fellowship of his suffering, the sharing of his suffering, what we're doing, we're praying for a limited power. And Paul says, I don't want a limited power in my life. I want, I want the full power which comes with the suffering. He goes on in verse, back in, in verse Philippians, he goes on to say this. Becoming like him in his death. Becoming like him, the word becoming like him means to be conformed, to have the same likeness. I want to be like Christ in his death. I want you to understand, this, 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 is, this, is, a, this is a prayer of a mature Christian. I want, to, I want to become like him in his death. Romans chapter 2, what does that mean, like him in his death? Romans chapter 2, verse I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 2. By no means, how can we who die to sin still live in it? Like him in his death means just as Jesus Christ died for my sins, being like him in his death means I die to my sins. 
just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, verse 4 says that we now walk in newness of life. That's what it means to be, to be conformed to the likeness of his death. It means we, that we've died to sin and we're walking a new life because he's raised from the dead. Verse 10 says that the death that he died to sin once and for all, but, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Paul says, I want to live a life that resembles the fact that Jesus died for my sin. How do I do that? I do that because I die to sin. I want to live a life that resembles the fact that Jesus raised from the grave. How do I do that? I do that by living a life of newness and a life that's holiness, of holiness. That's what Paul's saying. Back in Philippians chapter, chapter, chapter 3, he goes on to say, verse 11, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. That word resurrection is only used here one time. It means out resurrection. It means to be resurrected out from beyond, from, from, from beyond the corpse. What he's talking about there is the rapture. He's, he's talking about a partial resurrection where partial people are going to be resurrected. He says, I want you to know I am looking forward to the obtaining of this through the rapture. And so this was Paul's motivation. I want you to get this. Paul's motivation was this. In all the things that I do, beginning those things are behind, Paul says this, I want to know Jesus better. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in the sharing, in the fellowship of his suffering. I'm going to ask Tania and, and Kayla to come and, and sing a song, and then we'll continue with the message after that. With that song, that song sort of boils it down, right? That's Paul's heart. I, I want to know him. So the idea was what you want to know. The, the second part of this passage as we move on to verse 12 is the idea of, of attaining spiritual maturity. Of attaining spiritual maturity. Look at verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I strain forward to those things which are ahead. Paul, Paul basically says this. I want you to understand that I've not arrived. I've not obtained. I'm not complete. I'm not perfect. Now, you look at that and say, you know, Paul, if there's anybody in Christendom that is at least close to perfect. It's got to be you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, by this time, when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, Paul had been a Christian for probably 30 years. And in the eyes of many Philippians and many other people, Paul was a spiritual giant. Not only was he a spiritual giant to us, as we look at some of the things he did, he was a spiritual giant to them. He, many of them, he was the one who led them to Christ. And Paul said, I want you to know, as I evaluate my life, I've not arrived. I've not arrived. I still have further. And so what it tells us is this. In this Christian life, we will never get to the place on earth where we've arrived. Where we have grown as much as we can grow and we don't need to grow anymore. I don't need to read my Bible anymore. I don't need to do any of that more because I have made it. I am spiritual. I'm mature. Paul said we never get to that place. But Paul says, I continue to work at this. I continue to strive at this. He says, he says in verse 12, I've not already attained, but I press on. We'll talk about press on in verse 14. Because Christ has made me his own to make it my own, but Christ has made me. And what Paul says this, I am trying to become what Jesus Christ saved me to become. He laid hold of me. He saved me for a reason, and I want to become that. Now, I want you to understand, it's very important. He's not saying I'm trying to do what Jesus Christ told me to do because good works are important. God has saved us for good works, but he's talking about becoming. And sometimes we get doing and becoming mixed up. We get more concerned about what we do 
than what we become. And I think God is more concerned about what we become. Paul says, I want you to know my desire is to know Christ that I might become all that God, Jesus Christ, saved me to become. I want to become all those things that he has saved me to become, but I have not attained yet. And so sometimes what has to happen is this. We have to have a desire to grow and realize we never plateau. We never arrive. Because what that means is I have to do some self-evaluation. I can never be satisfied with my Christian walk. I can be satisfied with Christ. He's everything I need, but I can never come to the place where I'm satisfied in my Christian maturity. I have to continue to continue to follow after Christ. And there's some people who have become satisfied. You know what they do when they, when they do that self-evaluation and, and they find that they're, they're doing really, really good? Second, second, um, second, uh, uh, second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We're talking about I'm, I'm arrived. Let me just read with second. Well, I'll tell you. Second Corinthians chapter 10 says this. He says, do not be unwise. Those people who compare themselves with other people are unwise. So when I get to the place where I'm feeling pretty good about myself, where I'm feeling I arrive, you know what, I, what that means I'm doing? I'm comparing myself to where other people are spiritually. And I'm feeling pretty good about where I am. Because you can always find someone that you're doing better. But other people are not the standard, are they? Other people are not the goal. The goal is Christ. And I need to compare myself with Christ. And so, so and you've heard this song. I can't remember the song they used to sing a long time ago. Um, he's not, uh, God, be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. When he gets through with me, I will come forth as pure gold. And, and, and I love that song. The idea of that song is this. We're still in the process, but we can't use that as an excuse. Be patient with me. God's not through with me yet. That's my excuse for why I'm living the way I live. Because at some point, we've got to ask ourselves the question. On this scale of being what I used to be and being what God calls me to be, where am I in the scale? If I'm still living closer to what I used to be, then something's wrong because I'm not growing. Now, understand, I'm not going to make it here, but I'm progressing to get to that place. I'm progressing to get to that place. So Paul says we've not attained. Look at verse, verse 13. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. I have not arrived. But one thing I do. One thing I do. Oftentimes in Christianity, we can get caught up in so many different things. There's so many things that claim our attention. Paul says, I'm narrowing it down to one thing that I do. Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus has a discussion with Martha and Mary because Martha is trying to get the house together for dinner and Mary is not helping her. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to what Jesus says. And so Martha in Luke, in Luke chapter 10 says, Jesus says to her, but one thing is necessary and Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Martha, you're concerned about all these different things, but there's only one thing that is necessary. There's one thing you need to boil this down to. And Mary has chosen it, and that is to sit at my feet and to listen to me and have fellowship with me and to experience relationship with me. See, sometimes we've got so much going on that we miss the one thing. D.L. Moody, that great evangelist, before he was in Chicago, he, he, he taught Sunday school, he worked in the YMCA, he had all these different kind of things, he evangelized all these different ministries that he did. In 1871, after the fire in Chicago, D.L. Moody made it a decision that I'm going to concentrate on evangelism. And that is where my heart and that is where God has called me. And because of that, thousands and thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ because G.L. Moody understood the one thing that God had called in his life and placed in his life. Now, I'm not saying we only do one thing, but I think for some of us, what that means is this. We've got so many things going on that we can't really concentrate on the things we need to in order to be effective for God on the things that we need to. And we need to reevaluate some things and, and look at some things in that way. 
He says there, one thing is needed. He says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He said, what, 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 one thing is needed is I need to forget some things. I need to forget some things. There's some things in the past. <clears throat> there's some things in the past that you and I need to forget. Many of those things are the accomplishments that Pastor Hunt, Pastor Hunt talked about last week, that Paul's accomplishments. Some of those are his failures. Because if we're focusing on the things of the past, we cannot be effective in the present because things in the past. And Paul says, we've got to forget some of these things in the past. You've got to let some things go in the past. Even those achievements that you've done, those things that you've done, and, and, you know, and we have trophies and all these like that, we like to go back and think about, praise God, but I can't focus on those. Because yesterday's victories do not guarantee a win in the battles today, in today's battles. Right? You, 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 you can't talk, you talk to some people and they say, you know, they ask them what God's doing in their life, and they go back 20 years to tell them what God's done in their life. Yeah, 20 years ago, God did this and God did this. And you think, okay, has God done anything recently? Have there been any victories in your life recently? We can't rely on yesterday's victories to win the battle today. It doesn't work. It won't work. And so even those, those things, we've got to give up. But then there are those things that we need to forget. And, and the idea of forget is this. It doesn't mean that we have amnesia or we erase them out of our memory. What it means is, they no longer influence us. They no longer impact us. They no longer affect our life today because we have put them in the past. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. God says this in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 10, 17. Let me find it here. He says this in Hebrews 10, 17. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Isn't that a great verse? Now, please understand, it doesn't mean that God has amnesia. He doesn't remember it. What God is saying is, I no longer hold their sin against them. It no longer affects their stance with me because I've forgiven them and I've gotten rid of that, I've gotten rid of that sin. And so what he's saying there is understand that we have to forget certain things. We've got to get, forget the comedy. We have to forget even the failures. If you, ever, if you ever watch football, uh, there's, the, there's this wide receiver, and the wide receiver goes out for the touch, that goes out, and, 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 goes out and, and, and the quarterback throws him a pass, and the pass is right on target, and all he has to do is catch the ball and step into the end zone, and it's a touchdown, but guess what? He misses the pass, right? And you see he's upset, you see he's concerned, but he runs back to the huddle. And the next play, and what the announcers call this is that they have to have a short memory. They can't be thinking about the drop pass because the next play, it may be coming to them. So they've got to put that thing behind them and move on. You have to be able to have a short memory. That's what Paul's saying. I forget the failures. I forget the accomplishments. And then he says, I strain forward. Verse 13. He says there, I... He says there in verse 13 that I should, I'm in Hebrews, let me get to Philippians. He says, he says, I may consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which lie behind, straining forward to lies ahead. The word straining forward is, a, is, is another athletic term. It, it pictures a runner who is running of everything he has, and when he gets to the tape, he is reaching, he's stretching forward to get to that tape. Paul says, I am stretching forward to the tape. Because I'm, I'm, picture this. Can you picture somebody running a race, and as they're running the race, they're looking behind like this? It won't work, will it? Because they'll go out of their lane. You, you, you can't give your best effort going forward if you're still looking behind. And Paul says, I put the past behind and I am stretching out for what's ahead. I'm stretching out for today. I'm stretching out for the, for the future. I put these things behind and I am stretching out with everything I have. Every might that I have, I'm using it to move forward in this. Now, I want you to understand something. He's not talking about salvation. Because then that would be work salvation. And we don't work for our salvation. Our salvation is by grace. 
What he's talking about is sanctification. What he's talking about is spiritual maturity. He says spiritual maturity when you get saved is not just going to happen. There's no magic dust that makes you mature. You have to work at it. You have to stretch. You have to put yourself into it in order to grow spiritually. And he's talking about the spiritual maturity of the believer. Look at verse 14. He says, I press in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling. This is Christ likeness. Christ likeness. The idea of press and press means it is intense in endeavoring. It is aggressive, energetic action. I am taking energy. It's, if you can picture this, and, 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 and I think Paul, in a lot of his illustrations, he uses a lot of athletic terms, a lot of sports terms, because he's talking about the Olympic Games and the things they talked about in the Greek Olympics. I believe Paul would, would probably be an ESPN junkie if he was living today. He would be on ESPN all the time because he, he, there was a part of him that just loves sports. And the idea of pressing is this. It's almost like someone who's training for the Olympics. And maybe they're lifting weights and they're, and, and they're like, uh, uh, right, oh, if it happens, if I get stronger, it happens, if I get stronger, it happens, you know, whatever happens. You no, know, Paul says there is an enthusiasm, there is an active aggression to train my body. And so they're hitting these things hard. They're preparing themselves. That's the idea of pressing onward. I'm laboring in my spiritual walk to become more like Christ. To grow spiritually. He, said, he says there that I press on toward the goal of the prize. Now let me explain what the goal is. Take your, if you have your Bibles, turn to, to first to uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Romans 8. This is not only Paul's goal. This is our goal. Romans chapter 8. Look, if you would, at verse 28. We all know verse 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them. All things, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is what God said. God called us, he conformed, he conformed, he predestined us. This is the goal that Paul's talking about. I want you to get this. It is Christ likeness. It is being transformed into the image of Christ on earth. That's his goal. That while I am living on earth, I might become more like Christ. That I look more like Christ. That Christ lives through me even greater than he has before. That's his goal. That is the goal of not only Paul, that is the goal of every single Christian because God chose you, predestined you, that you would look like Christ. So the question is, am I becoming more like Christ. Not am I becoming more of a church person. Am I becoming more of what Christian people think I should come? Am I becoming more of what the world thinks? Of? Am I becoming more like Jesus Christ? That's the goal. That's Paul's motivation. That's why I want to know him better. That's why I want to know him better because I want to become more like him. I want to be conformed into his image, into his thinking into his action. He said, I want to be more like Christ. But then he says there in verse, he says there in verse, in verse 14, for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he talks about the goal. Now he talks about the prize. What's the prize? The prize is Christ likeness in heaven. The goal is Christ likeness on earth. The prize is Christ likeness in heaven. Look, if you would, at, at chapter four, I'm sorry, chapter 3. Look at verse 20 of chapter 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. That's the prize. The prize is when I get to heaven, and when you and I get to heaven, we are going to be like Christ. We are going to be transformed into being like Christ. That's the prize of the upward calling. 
The goal is to be like Christ on earth. The prize is to be like Christ in heaven. First John chapter first John chapter uh, one. First John chapter one. Verse I'm sorry. First John chapter three, verse two. <coughs> Beloved, we are God's children now. And what will it be? And what will we be? Has not yet been not, not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John says, it is, I'm not sure what heaven is going to look like, or what we're going to look like in heaven, but I do know this. When he appears, I am going to be transformed and I am going to be made like him. Look at verse 3. And everyone who has thus has hopes, thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. So as I think about the prize, that one day I am going to be like Christ. If I have that hope, it is going to purify the way I live now. It's going to change how I live now as far as me staying away from sin and living a pure life when I think about the fact that he is going, that I'm going to be like Christ. So Paul says my goal is to be like Christ on earth. The prize is that one day I'm going to be like Christ. Look at verse 15. Let those of us who are, who are mature think this way. So if you are a mature Christian, if you are a maturing Christian, Paul says you're going to have the same mindset. You're going to think this way. What do you mean by think this way? This is what you're going to think. First of all, you're going to, this is going to be your thought. I want to know him more than anything else in the world. The power of his resurrection in, in, in the sharing of his fellowship. I had that thought. I want to know Christ more than anything else. I realize that I have not attained, I've not arrived, and I never will arrive, and this is a process that I must continue going on. And then it is my desire to become like Christ. It's my desire to be Christ-like on earth, and I look forward to the day when I'm going to be Christ-like in heaven. And let those who are mature think this way, have this same attitude. Look what he says then after that, verse 15. And if any... If in, if, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So that those who are mature have think like this. But if you don't think that way, if you think otherwise, if you don't get this, if you don't understand it, God will reveal that to you afterwards. Now I want to tell you why that's important. I'll tell you why what Paul did. This is, this is amazing here. Paul said, if you don't think that way, it's not my job to convince you to think that way. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't be the Holy Spirit in your life. But God will convict you. God will convince you. God will bring things in your life to make you think this way about spiritual maturity. See, oftentimes this is what happens. We find ourselves trying to be the Holy Spirit for other people. Anybody ever done that? I'm going to convict you of what I think is right and I'm going to press on you and I'm going to let you know you need to understand and you need to change. And Paul said, that's not my place. My place is to live it before you. It's God's place to convict you of that, to work in your life. So we've got things twisted around. God has never called us to be the Holy Spirit for anybody else. God himself is the Holy Spirit who works in people's lives. He goes on to say in verse 16, Only let us hold true to what we have attained. The word hold true means to walk in line with what we've attained. So I'm not perfect. I've not attained spiritual maturity. I've not, I've not complete. But I have on this road, I have progressed. And Paul says, let us hold the line to how we progress. In other words, don't slip back into old ways. What God has done in your life, live what you know. Live the way that God has done in your life. Hold the line is what he's saying there. And what happens is this. He's saying, don't live below the position that Christ has given you in your maturity. Don't fade back and start going back and acting like you have not matured there. Live to the level of your maturity. 
Now, let me give you some things at home to discuss. Number one, discuss what habits and practices are needed for us to know Christ better. If I'm to be reaching for these things, if I'm to be pressing toward spiritual maturity, what are some of the practices and habits that are needed in my life to do that? What are some of the practices and habits are needed in my life to know Christ better? Number two, which of these practices will you apply and how will you apply them? It's one thing to know it. Okay, I, got, I get it. I should be spending more time in my word. I know that. How are you going to apply that? What are you going to do differently? How, what, what, what practices are important for you to apply that you may grow? And then what are you going to do to apply those practices? Because what, what I have found in my Christian life is this. We really never stay still. We are either moving forward or we're slipping backwards. And so to do nothing, we think, well, we just stay in the same. You ever, you ever been to the ocean and, and, st and, and put your feet in the ocean and not moved? And realize after a while you've actually moved further away from the shore because the sand is moving and the waves is moving. And it's, even though you're not walking out the shore, you've moved out of the shore because there's no such thing as staying still in one spot. Either we're progressing forward in Christ likeness and maturity or we are slipping back. And in order to deal with that, we have to have a plan into how we're going to grow spiritually and become more spiritually mature. Number three, what does Christ likeness really look like? What does Christ likeness really discuss that? What does Christ likeness really look like? And I, and I gave you a verse there, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, uh, 22 through, through 25. Spend some time reading that and then talk about what does Christ likeness really look like? Because if the goal for Christ, if Christ, the reason that Christ saved me, the reason he laid a hold of me is that I may become Christ likeness, I become like him, what does that look like? What does it look like in my house? What does it look like on my job? What does it look like in my life to become more like Christ? Folks, listen, I want you to understand this. There is a prize that God says that we're going to receive. And that prize is, that prize is Christ likeness in heaven. We're going to become like Christ. We're going to take on the body of Christ in heaven. And we're going to be like him. But Paul says, my goal in the meantime, while I'm living on earth, while I'm living this life on earth, my goal is to become more Christ-like on earth. That daily, yearly, monthly, I am becoming more like Christ. This is Paul's motive, one follower to another. Father, right now, I thank you for your word. Um, help us. Help us. Help us, Lord God, to surrender to you, to be all that you want us to be. Help us, Lord God, to have that one thing, and that is knowing you and becoming like Christ. And may that Lord, one thing, Lord God, uh, dominate our lives, dominate our focus. Thank you, Lord God, that you don't give up on us. Thank you, Lord God, that you don't hold our sins against us that they don't affect our standing in you. And you are patient with us, and your desire is that everything that happens, that we become like Christ. We surrender, Lord, to you. Make us like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, I, I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank you for listening in, if you're listening on Zoom. And I pray you have a blessed week, the remainder of the week. Father, right now, as we leave this place, be honored and glorified in us and through us. May we not just be hearers, but may we be doers of your word. And we give you all praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.